Good morning. Thank you for being here today. My name is Megan Essen, and it is my great pleasure to introduce, to speak to you today, Lloyd Rath. Lloyd is from the Community Violence Intervention Center here in Grand Forks. And Lloyd is the coordinator of the New Choices program for the CVIC and has been working with violent offenders since 1998. Prior to his work at the CVIC, Lloyd served in the US Army for 20 years, retiring as a first sergeant in 1977. He then attended the University of North Dakota where he earned a bachelor's degree in social work in 1981. After graduating from college, Lloyd was employed with Tri-County Community Correction Center in Crookston, Minnesota for more than 20 years. After graduating, um, Lloyd has coordinated from the State Batterers Treatment Forum for the North Dakota Council on Abused Women's Services since February of 2003. He also serves on many committees for the Grand Forks Coordinated Community Project. Today, Lloyd will be speaking about the New Choices Program at the CVIC. This program seeks to challenge offenders' belief systems in order to evoke change. Domestic violence is heavily rooted in the belief that one sex should be subservient to the other in a relationship. This belief leads to physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. In order to provide treatment to offenders, it is important to identify and understand these belief patterns. Laws have been passed to provide safety for victims and offender accountability, and the New Choices program offers treatment to the offenders. The program offers offenders the opportunity to work introspectively and as a group to solicit behavior change through group discussion and accountability. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Lloyd Rath. Thank you. I give a couple disclaimers when I start <coughs> teaching and or start instructing and talk about my program. Uh, one of them is, is since 1998, I've worked with men who have committed domestic violence. They've been convicted in the court or they've been a deprivation case out of social services, but for some reason they have domestic violence in their background. And I've been doing that since 1998. So on my presentation, I always talk as if the Man is the perpetrator and the female is the victim. In that, I always get a lot of questions afterward, not a lot of questions, but some guy in the group always says, well, women commit violence too. And we know that, and we do offer a program for women also uh, in the program that I have, but I mainly do the men's program, and so I talk that way. The other part about that is on occasion, I will use some of the same language that the offender probably uses. <clears throat> and reason being is, is that I can say, um, and as was set up here, that they call their partner names, uh, and calling names has one impact for all of you, okay? But if I tell you that they call her a dumbass fucking bitch, it means just a little bit more than just calling them a name and that. So I don't mean to offend anybody, <laughs> but um, Carrie, who is our education person that does most of that, always kind of talks to me about my language after we do a presentation. But, um, but I try to keep it to minimum. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about how a guy gets into our program, <clears throat> and then I want to spend most of the time really about what we do in our program and whether um, men really change or men don't change. Um, and, and we'll talk about that also. But uh, moving on, some of these slides you're going to have just seen, <laughs> but I'll try to talk to them uh, about them in a little different way. But we believe very strongly that in order to really consider something, we need to understand what the domestic violence is really about <clears throat> and what's going on with the domestic violence. So it's important to understand the context of what the domestic violence is about. And if we don't understand the context of it, really what's happening is, is that we're sending the victim up for, at bigger risk. Um, so we're really putting her in danger. It also really re <clears throat> results in law enforcement making an inappropriate response or making the wrong arrest or some other things like that. And what really happens is that if we don't know that, what we really are doing is that we're encouraging the offender or reinforcing the offender that what he's doing is probably okay because we haven't seen it in the context it was. So we're going to talk. Well, the other part about that is, and you saw this one also, but we really need to understand if we're in the context of that is, is that what was the intent of the offender? And that's what we really look at when we have the men come into group. And we spend a lot of time um, 
talking to them about what their intent was, what they hoped to accomplish, and why they did that um, in the group and that and everything else. But simply because what their intent was doesn't necessarily mean that's what the impact was on the victim. And so it's also important for us to know is that what did it mean to the victim of what he did, you know? Did it make her, did it put her down? You know, did it make her feel less as a person? Did it make her feel like she was a bad mom? <clears throat> and that he would say he just does that to get her back on track and get her to do what he needs to do. We would say it has a major impact on her. <clears throat> and then the other thing is, is there a pattern of this going on? And we look at that, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about the guys that come into there. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the types of battering that we see. And Ellen Pence, who since has passed away, but used to be with the Domestic Violence Project in Duluth, Minnesota, and she did a long study on the different types of violence that happens within relationships and wrote an article about that. And so that's where we got this information from. But I'm going to talk about these types of, of uh, violence within relationships. And the first one I talk about is really about battering. In reality, it <coughs> reality is, is that there are some places now that are saying maybe battering isn't the word that we should be using. Because if I use the word battering, the majority of you said out there probably think that somebody is getting beat pretty heavily, pretty regularly on a regular basis. That they're walking away with a lot of bruises and that and everything else. That does happen. But when we're looking at at that, we look at the use of abusive tactics. So anything that he is doing, whether it's emotional, you know, physical or sexual, whatever he's doing, we would look at that as being battering or an ongoing pattern of that. And so it really is done based on their entitlement. And I'll talk about the top five reasons why men tell us that they use violence in that little bit. But again, what we're always looking for is, is the violence escalating? Has it got worse? You know, does it happen more often? And that's a good sign for us. Uh, of course, men that we work with are in a lot of denial about what they did. Um, and reality is, is that they probably know the right answers to tell us at that point. And so the escalation really doesn't come out as, yeah, I got more severe. Uh, she got to be a dumber ass, you know or she became the psycho bitch, uh, you know, and what was I supposed to do? So we look at resistive or reactive violence, and this is where we see most of the women, and the women that come to our program that get referred to us, when we look at them and interview them and do an intake with them for our program and that and everything else, what we find is, is that from childhood on or somewhere in their life, they've probably been sexually abused, molested some way. They've been physically abused by a partner. <clears throat> and so the women that come in ours are really using the reactionary violence. And this is really done for self-defense, you know, to get the guy off of me. <clears throat> we um, have had women in group uh, who basically said, and, and the story kind of goes, that we woke up about 8 o'clock one morning and I couldn't do anything right. I couldn't cook his meals right. I couldn't, you know, clean the house right. I wasn't taking care of the kids right. I wasn't doing anything else. About 8 o'clock at night, I got tired of 12 hours of his shit and I hauled off and hit him in the nose. When she hauled off and hit him in the nose, she actually fractured his nose, you know. So who went to jail? She went to jail. Who got charged with aggravated assault? She got charged. Why did she do all of that? She got tired of his shit. And she did it, and uh, ultimately ended up being that. But usually in reactionary violence, it's there because I'm just tired of what's going on in my life, and I don't want it to happen anymore. And so I'm really trying to stop the violence that is going on, and I end up really using the violence against the person that used violence against me. And then we talk about situational violence. And situational violence probably happens in relationships. Shirley and I were married for almost 48 years, and reality is, is there were times that Shirley and I had an argument over one specific issue. It wasn't about our whole life. It wasn't about what we did before or after that or anything else. It was about one specific issue. 
And in that, we may have said things that we regretted after we said that. In that situation, we always also may have pushed the other person or, you know, made a rude comment, as I said, or something like that on that, okay? But there was never any intention to cause any bodily harm to anybody, and it was really only about that issue that we were arguing about at that point. And so there is a lot of situational violence in relationships, and we would consider situational violence in that. This is what the guys would try to tell the court system, and this is what many of the victims will say also when they're going through the court process, is, is that it's only a one-time incident. This doesn't happen other times. You know, it only happened this one time. <clears throat> and this is really where the courts sometimes make the mistake because they take that in as being, this is only a one-time situation. There's not any history there. Minnesota is a little bit ahead of North Dakota uh, in some things, and in some things, maybe Minnesota's a little behind North Dakota. But one of the things that happens in most of the domestic violence cases in Minnesota, they require a pre-sentence investigation report or a domestic violence assessment, whatever they want to call it, before they do sentencing, which at that point they would be able to deal out the situational violence and the report obviously would show a history of violence in there, if there was a history of violence in there, or if it was a situation, they would do that. In North Dakota, uh, unless it's a felony, there's probably not a pre-sentence investigation done before they come into the court system. So the court makes a decision whether they decide, the judge makes a decision whether it's a situation or he feels it's situational violence or whether there's actually a history of violence in there. And my guess is without a good attorney that can bring all that in before sentencing or something like that, a lot of times the court don't get that. What we kind of do know <laughs> is that that if it is just a situational violence, that law enforcement probably isn't involved in that. And it's always my belief that, um, and some of the guys tell me what they learn out of our group is, is that next time I'm gonna be the first one that calls the cops. I would tell you this, if either one of you in a relationship need to call the cops for any reason at all, you have a problem. It's not about who calls the cops first and who then the other person has the problem. It's about if the cops have to come to my house because my argument got so out of control, then I have a problem. And that's what needs to happen and be understood. And we talk about pathological violence. And this is the other part about it is, is that you hear a lot of the cases come into court that he only does it when he's drinking. He only does it when he's under the influence of alcohol. I will tell you this, that we have more drunks in this world that don't abuse their partner, then we have drunks that abuse their partners. So alcohol isn't an excuse. And we don't allow guys to come to group and say, if I didn't drink, I wouldn't, uh, you know, do this, because it never happens when I'm not drinking. What we know about alcohol is, is that alcohol just makes us a little stronger, it makes us a little more daring. But what it does in, in domestic violence cases, it probably just makes him a little more violent. And so what we really hear is extreme cases is, is that they were under the influence of drugs or alcohol in some way. And that's the cases where the partner ends up at the, the emergency room at the hospital or something like that. <clears throat> so we don't let them use alcohol as excuse. If alcohol is an issue, um, or if there's some mental health issues there, we would like, and hopefully they will, get that taken care of before they come into our program. So if it's a mental health issue and he needs to be on medication, we would require him to be on medication before he comes there, or at least get an update psychological evaluation that kind of tells us that he would be okay being there. If it is an alcohol problem, we probably have them, or most likely in all cases, have them start some kind of alcohol or drug or alcohol treatment prior to coming into our program. Once they move into an aftercare program, we would probably take them back into our program. But the conflict um, with doing that when they're under the influence of alcohol is, is that they just don't get it. They're not ready to focus on it. Um, they come to group uh, not ready to focus on anything uh, because the alcohol is the primary concern. And that's all they're worried about is when is this over so I can get my next drink or what happens there. And so we try to clear that up. 
There is more research now and there's more people now talking about that domestic violence treatment should be a part of alcohol, drug and alcohol treatment also, and we should treat those people together. Same with mental health. If we have mental health issues, then the mental health professionals should be trained in domestic violence, so that that's kind of treating them together. I know years ago when I was a probation officer, uh, we started using uh, the LSIR to assess uh, offenders, and then along with that went the program that was a cognitive restructuring program of Thinking for Change. And one of the things that they taught you in Thinking for Change is, is that you as a person, the probation officer would deliver this program to a group of people about changing their thinking about the criminal behavior that they had and, and that and everything else. But what they said is that everybody else who provides services for this person needs to know the same program. So they did two types of training, those who were going to present the program and then those for the, op, the uh, uh, supporting personnel who maybe would come in contact with him and that so that we all talk the same language. I really believe that's important in domestic violence. So you heard already the, the presentation this morning where obviously we talk the same language. So if they go over to mediation, she's kind of talking the same language that we talk. And if they go somewhere else, we have a probation officer here in Grand Forks who works directly with us. Uh, she went to Duluth, got trained. She's pretty much along with us and everything else. So when she talks to the offender, she talks to him the way we talk to him in group and what we're teaching him. But it's about what we give them in group needs to be reinforced by people in the community that they come in contact with. And so it's important that you learn more about that. <clears throat> and then we just had the people who have antisocial behavior. These people are just violent. But what you see is, is that they have violence in all aspects of their life. So this person is out on the street beating somebody up. Um, you know, he's in his house beating somebody up. Uh, he's, you know, over to church beating somebody up. Uh, he may be anywhere. Uh, these people don't do good in group. Um, and uh, they give the facilitators a harder time than, uh, than we give them. So we try to not have them in group but reality is, is that we do have them in group, uh, and we do bring them in, and in some ways we hope that they would change their behavior. But these are the people that are hardest to give any kind of treatment to, and probably don't change very much in their behavior. So I want to go in, and I want to talk just a few minutes about what does a guy look like that comes to our program? I've already said that he's in a lot of minimization, denial, and blame already in that, but what else is about him? First of all, we have a program designed in such a way that we think about victim safety first of all, and then holding the offender accountable. And we can argue about what's accountability and what's not accountability. Glenn's going to tell you that the guy has to spend some time in jail to be accountable before he can go into the program, and I don't know why she's going to tell you that or not. Sarah would tell you that back there. Both of them are advocates, I guess. That's why I'm just giving them a hard time there. But, but there's a strong belief that if they go to jail, he's going to be held accountable. We know people that have worked in corrections for years. Okay? We know that jail time without any kind of treatment, without any kind of education, does nothing at all. All it does is makes another offender because he idolizes the guys that he's in jail with. You know, He learns from them. <clears throat> and he goes on and becomes a better offender than they were. So, reality, we're not, I'm not standing here telling you today that people shouldn't go to jail. We recently had a guy come in and his sentence was uh, 15 days in jail for a domestic violence incident, which is not very severe, uh, you know. And he had got arrested on the weekend, so he got credit for three days. So he really had um, 12 days of jail time left to do. And he came to us for an evaluation, and we said that we do a 27-week, which is about six months program. <laughs> and he said, you got to be shitting me. You know, I do six months in your program or 20 days in jail? You know I'm going to jail. And he did. And he went in and told the judge, and he's going to do it on the weekends, so he doesn't even spend the full 12 days. He just spends a few weekends in there and everything else. So he makes weight. So I'm saying... Guys that have a year hanging over their head, 
do much better in our program than the guys that have 30 days hanging over their program. So the jail sentence is an important part. I'm not saying that people shouldn't be sentenced to jail. And a lot of times I'd let them spend some time in jail before I really bring them out and put them in the program because I think they get the gist of jail at that point. Um, too many of them don't even, other than the night or day that they spend in jail, uh, don't spend a lot of that other time in jail that they have a sentence and over their head. But they do need to have something over their head to really motivate them in there and that and everything else. So accountability does call for going to jail or having jail time hanging over your head. But then it does require accountability for you to get into a program where you can learn how to change those behaviors that you were using and cause you to get in trouble there. So this was already talked about a little bit, but I'll try to explain it again. Obviously, what we look for is a man who really believes that men are superior to women. And we know as men that women were put on this earth to serve us. You're here to have children for us, and when you have that child, take care of it. Take care of it, good. Make sure it's successful in school, but don't bother me with it. We know that you're here to cook for us. We know that you're here to clean our house for us. That's the general belief that males have. Okay, Now, men come to my group and tell me this, <clears throat> that they didn't have a father, their father would left, their father died, their father was gone, and all they had was three sisters and a mom. So they know they respect women and that and everything else, and they don't have any male values and beliefs. If you were raised with a penis, you have male values and beliefs. You don't lose them simply because I was raised by women. You still get those because we see what's going on in our society and we know what's going on. We make the person an object, and I've already told you that. Name calling is one thing. And when men come to our group, they are required to use their partner's name. Because all along in that relationship, they've, used, they've made her an object. You know, she's been the dumb bitch. You know, can't do a fucking thing right. But we make them use the name because when they become a Shirley, when they become, uh, you know, a Susan, when they become a Beth, they become a real person, okay? Then they're not the object that they talked about before. They're the real person they had. They're very selfish people. All mo The majority of the people that we bring into our group, if we put them on a scale or if they took psychological evaluation, they would probably show that they're pretty high in the narcissistic uh, range. They very much love themselves and it's about self profit And reality is, is that our system still offers very little consequences for domestic violence. As I said, a 12-day sentence for possibly beating my wife bad enough that she ended up in the emergency room, my partner is in the emergency room, really isn't much of a consequence for somebody there. And so the rewards have been for them. They've gained almost everything. Maybe law enforcement or maybe nobody, victim advocates haven't been involved. Maybe a whole lot of things of that and everything else. But there hasn't been a lot of consequences for them. So they go on and talk about it. So I know David Letterman does top ten. I don't do the top ten. I only do top five. So what are the five top reasons that men say they use domestic violence? Well, the number five reason is, is that they were drunk. Now, I know that most of you would probably put the number five reason or the number five reason drunk or under the influence of drugs and alcohol at the top, I would say that about 85% of the men that come to our program have probably been under the influence of drugs at some times when they've been abusive to their wife. But in the majority of the cases, we can find times that they've also been abusive to their wife when they haven't been under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So I think it gets confusing when they come in and say it's only about alcohol because alcohol is a big part of domestic violence and a lot of the people, as I say, about 85% of the people we see have had incidents with alcohol or drugs where they've been violent. And so we can write that off as saying, yeah, he just does it when he's drunk and you really need to look at it. The other is stress, okay? I'm the man of the family. I make the money for this family. I have a job that I work at all day long and I don't need pressure when I come home. 
when I come home, I want my children quiet. I don't want them running around the house making noise, you know. I'm stressed out. I've had a bad day at work. And you just need to understand that you need to give me that time. The good intentioned one is the hardest one for me to understand. They simply men tell us is that they needed to beat the shit out of their partner because she didn't understand. She didn't understand five o'clock is supper time and when I come home from work, I want supper on the table and the supper isn't there. And how many times do I have to tell her? I've told her that, I've hollered that at her, and I think the only way she's gonna get the message is if I beat her ass. What we also know is that a lot, a large number of the men that come to our program are also raised in abusive homes. And I would stand here today to tell you this, that spankings don't change behavior. Spankings only teach about violence. That when my parent gets violent with me and spanks me, here regardless of a small spanking that doesn't leave marks or anything else, in my book it's violence and I've taught my child that violence gets me what I want. And that's what these guys definitely think. Violence gets you what you want. And so I told her she didn't do it. I whipped her ass. She probably still didn't do it, but he thinks that he got more. Losing control, <clears throat> it is a choice they make. It, these people do not lose control because a lot of them have jobs in the community and they have never. And you can't tell me that you haven't went to your job where you've wanted to tell your boss, take his job and shove it. Okay? You can't tell me you haven't did that because you have. And these guys have did too, but they haven't told their boss, take your job and shove it. They've been frustrated with him, they've been angry with him, they've been whatever they want to be. But you know what? They know it involves a paycheck, and they do that. But with their partner, they say, well, I want to lose, con I lost control. It isn't about control, it's about a choice that I make. Okay? And then the other one is, is that she pushed my button. She just knows what to do, and she pushed my button. That's kind of the way it is, you know. If she wouldn't push my button, if she wouldn't do those things, she wouldn't get in that trouble. And so, again, it's really about just putting it all back onto her. So, <clears throat> what's our program really about, and what do we do in that? I'd say there's three major things in there. <clears throat> One of them is, is that we want men to identify goals that they need to reach to live a non-violent lifestyle. And the other is, is that they need to really identify what their behavior is and what caused them to do that. And then they need to explore ways that they can um, really change that belief system that they have. Okay? So how do we do that? We have 10 themes, and I'm gonna go through the themes with you here in a little while, but we have 10 themes that we use. And each theme that we cover, covers three weeks. And I know it's only a 27-week program, and you're saying, Lloyd, that's 30 weeks. And I know it's 30 weeks, but we still only do 27. But they get all the themes that we have because many of the themes kind of roll on together. And so they all combine in that. into So they're building on one another, and they all kind of combine. But basically what happens is, is that we, and I've been doing it since 98, and they were doing it before I was, and domestic violence program, for men is still really changing because we've never really been sure what it really takes to teach them. So for years we did domestic violence that we brought guys in and we set them in the chair and said, you know, the only way you're ever going to get out of this group is you're going to tell me every bad thing that you ever did to your partner. You know, you're going to tell me every time they hit her and that and everything else. And you know what we got? We got pretty much nothing. We got all excuses about it's her fault. We got all excuses about <clears throat> if I wasn't drinking. I got all that and everything else. So what we learned in that process is, is that reality is, is that we never really taught men what's appropriate behavior or what a good relationship looks like. And so part of what we do now is in the first week when they come in is, is, is that we talk to them about what do you think that a respectful relationship looks like? You know? And what Oh, to you, what would a respectful relationship look like? And we don't let them use the excuse that if she'd just be more submissive, because that's not what we're looking at. What we're saying, and so we have them find somebody in their life that they respect, we have them find somebody in their life that they trust, whatever it might be, the topic that we're on, somebody about that, and then kind of talk about what were the characteristics that 
made you trust this person? What were they that trust you? And that's what we really talk about. What does a healthy relationship look like? In the second week, we really talk about abusive behavior. And during the second week, how we really start out is that we just show a vignette of a man using the tactic that we're talking about that day and the theme and that and everything else. And then we do what they call a control log uh, based on the man's behavior. Well, we'll look at, at his behavior, the man has been yet, you know, what was his actions, what was his intent, what was his belief system, what were the effects. And while we're doing that, we start bringing in their incidents about that. What I want to tell you is that what we found out is, is that really in the first week, when we talk about <clears throat> the respectful behavior, we find the guys revealing more to us than we did when we sat them down in the chair and say that. Because we'll say, you do this in a respectful behavior, and the guy says, shit, I've never did that. This is what I do. And they don't even realize that they're telling us how abusive they were in that relationship and that everything else. So by the time we get in the second week, the guy has already told us some things. So if he wants to say, well, I didn't really do anything, we'd say, well, last week you talked about this. Well, yeah, but. And then we kind of do that. And anyway, so then we can pull their things in. Or we make a list of the man's behavior on the board about all the actions that he did in the incident that we showed him on the vignette. And then we say to the guys, can you own any of these in there? And some of the guys say, I can own the whole list. And some of them say one, two, or three of them. But they all can relate to those and everything else. So now we have them kind of relating to their own violent behavior. <clears throat> and then that third session is where we really talk about their belief system. See, I said earlier that if you were raised as a male, you are a male, and you get some belief system in there. See, our belief system comes from how we were raised. Our belief system was established way back here. So he will say that I did this to her because I believed she would respond to me, but that's not his belief system. That's an action that he believed he could get. His belief system is what makes it okay for me to use violence in my relationship. So in all of the themes that we have, that's what we're asking, continually challenge them about. What made it okay for you to do that? So, I can, well, I will, but I'll use emotional abuse right now. I can tell you, all of you, if I asked you, what was your belief system about emotional abuse? My guess is the majority would say that emotional abuse really isn't bad. And the reason you don't think emotional abuse is really bad is because early on in life, in elementary school, maybe even before that, what you learned is that if I can put the other person down, I look good. And so all of us are raised, really, with emotional abuse around you. Okay? Now, it gets more severe as we get older. Obviously, it gets more severe as we go along. But it's just a belief system that says everybody uses it. So we hear a lot of things about, about from the guys that says, well, well, she uses it too, or we both use it, or I don't call her name until she calls me a name. Reality is we both come out with kind of the same belief system, so reality is that we probably both do use it in a relationship and put each other down in some cases. And that and everything else. Reality is that it isn't good in a relationship. It isn't good for me to put my partner down. Good for me to tell my partner she doesn't know how to cook. Because the old saying kind of goes, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. It's totally wrong, you know. Broken bones do get healed. The name calling probably doesn't get healed real quick. So what are the themes that we use? They're based on the power and control wheel. <clears throat> okay. In order for me to use power and control, and that's what we really try to focus on with the men, it's about the power and control that they use in their relationship. And that's the choice that I make, to use power and control based on the, I'm the superior person there and everything else. But in order for me to use power and control, I need to establish in my partner that I can pretty much hurt her in some way. And so the solid line on the outside there that shows physical and sexual violence, what has to happen is, is that I need to establish in my partner that whether I have sexually abused her, whether I've physically hit her, I have probably established in her that this could happen. Kind of goes back where I talked about my intent and what she's seen it as, or what it meant to her, what the feeling was to her is, that if she ever has that, 
So when we talk about the topic of physical violence <coughs> in relationships, guys will tell us, well, I probably shouldn't be in your group because I haven't been physically violent with my partner. I never hit her, you know? Or the other one is that I've only hit her once, you know? Or the other one is, well, I didn't leave any bruises. I didn't hit her that hard. That's kind of the way they talk in groups sometimes. Anyway, the point is, is that we make them look at that to say, if my partner feared that I could hurt her, then you use sexual violence, or physical violence. And kind of the same way in sexual violence. I, mean, I haven't had a man come in a group that tells me at one point or another he hasn't kind of coerced, manipulated, went past no with his partner in that and everything else. <clears throat> and my guess is, is that at some point we learn that this body really isn't ours, it belongs to him. You know? And he can really demand it, he can really force it, you know, he can be real physical to get it, or he can just kind of manipulate and beg and, and whatever he does. But as a man, we probably begged at one time or another to our partner, uh, even when she said no. Um, and again, you know, what does that do to her? Well, it tells her a little bit about that, yeah, I don't have as much control over my body as I really like to have as he kind of sucks me into it every once in a while that I gotta give in, because I get tired of his whining, whatever it may be. And so again, <clears throat> we talked to them about, you know, what have you really did? <clears throat> I think it's interesting. Sarah used to do the victim contacts for us, and one of the things that she would ask him about sexual abuse, if they've ever been sexual abuse, and depending on how she asked it, would be the answer that she got. In the majority of the cases, she got no, there was never any sexual abuse in there. And yet when we had the guys in group, and would talk to them about our perception of what we believe sexual violence is and have them kind of identify what that is and that and everything else, is that they would identify times when they have, you know, really went past where they should have went past with their partner to get her to have sex with them. And so, again, it's about where it is. But I don't think it's easy for anybody, you know, irregardless who you are, male, female, or anybody else, I don't think it's easy for you to stand up in front of somebody and talk about sexual abuse or how I've been sexually abused, let alone when the victim advocate calls me and talking to me on the phone and says, you know, has there ever been any sexual abuse in your relationship? My guess is the first response is no, uh-uh, it's all kind of okay. Because that's not the topic that we really want to talk about is sex. Guys don't want to talk about sex when we do the sex topic in group, you know? And again, we don't have them sit down and tell us about their most intimate um, time where they, you know, had the best rough sex that they ever had. Because um, guys tell me that rough sex is good. I don't know. Wouldn't be my type of sex, I just got to tell you that. <clears throat> but we don't have to do that. What we really want to talk about, what does it take to have a respectful sexual relationship? What it takes to have a, special, uh, a respectful sexual relationship is, is that I need to know that this is my body and I set boundaries for my body. And I need to know that Shirley's body is Shirley's body and Shirley sets boundaries for her body. And those boundaries may change from day to day. Today, Shirley may feel a little bit more like she wants to have sex. But the next day, she might not feel that way. And what I need to do is understand what you need to do in the relationship is understand that each person has their own body and each person has the right to set the boundaries for their body of where they want. And so irregardless whether you're my partner, irregardless of whether we've been married for 100 years, you still have the right to say no and you have the right to control your body when you have that. So what are the other topics that we use? Um, they're all in there, again, on the circle. So we use a lot about intimidation, and intimidation comes in many forms. And so again, it's not about us going up and having a definition of intimidation, although cell phones are the downfall of all of us because now they all want to Google up the definition, and we don't want them to Google up the definition. Uh, we want them to Google their own definition of it. So it's really about challenging them about what's intimidation mean to them, and how has intimidation been used towards them and how they feel when that intimidation was used. So that's kind of the first week that we're talking about with them about how, what's respectful and, and where does this intimidation come from and that and everything else. Because they need to identify that reality is, is that 
all of us in some way or form, uh, you know, have been subject to intimidation and intimidation kind of goes along with most everything that we do. And, um, you know, again, it's just kind of, these aren't things that are strange. These topics that we use here, um, they'd be good for any man, um, whether you're in a bad relationship or not a bad relationship because it just really challenges us about the things that we use and how sometimes they're very subtle and how sometimes they're very severe and I really meant to intimidate her at that point. Sometimes there's things that I said that may have intimidated her that wasn't what I meant to do. That wasn't where I was at. So we really haven't explored the intimidation part about it. And I've talked a little bit about emotional abuse. I won't go into that much more, you know. But I believe very strongly that we live in a society, I mean, we just watched over your campaign ads, you know? And tell me those guys didn't emotionally abuse each other and put each other down. And uh, I mean, we live in a society that says emotional abuse is okay. It's okay to put the other person down so that I look good. It's okay to put the other person down so that I get my way. And that's what I grew up with and that's what I use. That's what I know, you know. I have um, 11 grandchildren, uh, four of them are in California, and I just recently spent about three weeks out there with them, and then I have the rest of them in town here, you know, and I have uh, uh, my oldest grandson, well, my one grandson in town here, um, you know, um, just plays hockey for Central, and he just finished tryouts yesterday to get on a team again this year. You know, one of the things that he, over the summer, he struggled with, well, they wanted to play hockey again this year or not, because of how they talked to each other in the locker room. And he was really offended by that. He's my grandson, so he's a good kid. But, um, <laughs> but, but he was really offended about how they put each other down. And I think he's raised in a home, and I hope he's raised in a home where, where they're encouraged. Um, they're not put down to succeed, but they're encouraged to succeed. They're, they're given positive feedback and, and reinforcement and that, and not, not put down. <clears throat> and Grandpa has to be careful when he's with him because I don't want to put him down either. And so I always try to find ways to enforce him and say positive things. Even when he says things, I think, what the hell are you doing that for, Cameron? <laughs> but, <clears throat> but anyway, I don't do that and, and that and that. But yeah, he struggled over summer because he said it's unbelievable the way they put each other down and how they are in the locker room and that. He said, I don't know whether I want that. And he has a younger brother and he said, I sure don't want Quinn exposed to that. I'm like, I'm the big brother. I've took it all on now. Quinn shouldn't have to be exposed to it, you know. But yeah, it's just part of us. Emotional abuse is there and it's wherever we go. I mean, we see it in our workplace. We see it there. It's part of our thing. Isolation. I think you really got to think about isolation when we live in North Dakota. Okay? And what we really find is, is that we have guys that have moved their partner several times. They've kind of moved her from the city out in the rural and a little bit more in the rural. And I really stop and think about it. If we only have one car and he has a job and I live out here um, in the rural somewhere, who takes the car to work? And what do I do? See, all of them don't have cell phones. A lot of families can only afford one cell phone. Now, I know that's not true, but they can only afford one cell phone. Because then who has to take the cell phone to work? Because what if she needs to call him? Well, you dumbass, you didn't leave the phone at home. How's she going to call you? You took it with you. But he would tell us that he needed to take it with him. See, so isolation comes in so many other ways, and I, I think you can imagine how many other ways there are that we isolate our partner. But in a rural community like we live in here, in a rural state of North Dakota, you know, isolation is really pretty easy to do. Find an affordable house outside of town a little bit. You know. A lot of blaming, denying, and minimizing. You can probably hear, by the way, I've talked that the excuses the men use, how they minimize, deny, and blame what they did. And then using children. And we do a three-week um, session with the men about the use of children. 
Uh, what we have changed the topic to it to be really though is that we talk more about responsible parenting. But what we really challenge the guys out there is to really talk about the home that they were raised in and the parents that they were raised by. We have some vignettes like they, or some videos like they showed here at the start of the session today. Uh, but we use one in, in there where the children are, are being abused and that very honestly is probably the topic that we should start all the men off with coming to group because it's very the topic when we start talking about the effect it has on their children and what did they do to their children. See, I can get together with this woman here and I can have a child with her. And then I can say, I don't want to live with you anymore and our relationship is over. But if I want to be a part of that child's life, our relationship is never over. Because, see, this child has one mother and it has one father. And it was these two people that came together to have that child. And so when the guys come in and tell us, well, I'm not with her anymore, we're not in the relationship. And if they have children in there, I tell them, you still are in the relationship. Have a child and you want to be part of that child's life, other than paying the child support, which they don't like to pay, if you want to be a part of that child's life, then you're in a relationship with this person. Yeah, our relationships isn't about jumping in bed with her anymore because we don't do that anymore. The relationship is about we're trying to co-parent this child. We're trying to raise this child to be perfect. So we talked to them about that, that they still are in a relationship. And what's their investment in the child's life? And after they look at their own life and how they were raised, and that's how I can stand here and say that about you know, the majority of the guys that come to our group were probably raised in some pretty bad homes. or At least were exposed to violence of some type in their home or as they grew up. Because it just doesn't, I don't think that anybody wakes up one day and say, oh, I want to be a violent person today. Um, I, I just don't think that's part of it. I think that, that we see violence, we're exposed to violence, and we use violence. And I think that's where it really comes from. Then we talk to them about male privilege, and that is the hardest subject for the men to understand. They believe that we were, that we live in an equal society nowadays, and there are no such things as male privilege. And so, when we challenge them about what male privilege is, obviously the first answer is that I get to stand up and pee, and you don't. That's not a male privilege. That's just kind of the way God made us. Didn't make it a privilege, it made it a benefit, actually. Uh, when you stop and think about all the process, but we won't go into that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, it's, a, it's really challenging to them about what that is. You know? But then we really bring it around. And we use a lot with them, um, as I told you um, about the man being superior, we use a triangle with them sometimes to really talk about our society and we can take their job. And so if you have a job, and if I put you on a triangle and I divide it in three, who's at the top up there? Well, probably, you know, their boss, whoever that might be, or the owner of the company, or whatever it might be is kind of up there. And then in the middle you have this supervisor kind of person, and then on the bottom you have the worker down here. And we use that to talk to them about superiority and relationships also, but when we talk about that. So what's the job of the person in the middle? The supervisor, the foreman, whatever you want to call him, what's his job? Well, his job is to get the people at the lower level to do the job, to get the work done, to make the guy at the top happy. So he's kind of caught in the middle with that. And who's the guy down at the bottom? Well, he's the guy at the bottom that gets all the stuff that's rolling downhill to get the job done. And then we kind of take that and put that into a relationship that if we have children in that relationship and you're at the top and your children are at the bottom, what's it, life for, what's it like for that person that's in the middle? She's trying to keep you happy, okay? She's trying to be fair with the children, you know? And she doesn't want to, you know, I discipline the children because they made dad unhappy, you know? And so she's really caught in that bind and we talk to them about that, about what do you think she has to go through to really accomplish all those things, to keep you happy and kind of keep those children in line and stay after them? 
that's really um, what we try to use to get them to understand about how I have this philosophy about if I'm the male and if I make the money, then I have the most say in the family. Not true. Relationships are about both of us having the same say and about being equal. That's the other thing that we talk about is, is that um, when we talk about um, shared responsibility, when we talk about male privilege, also in shared responsibility. And so men tell us all the time that relationships can be 50-50. And I try to get them to divide 50-50. See, is doing the dishes in the house the same as mowing the lawn outside? And are those 50-50? Probably not. Depends how many kids you have. Mark and Warren have five kids, and so there's seven of them at the table when they eat, and that's a lot of dishes. And it doesn't take that long to mow the lawn outside because they don't have that big a yard. The reality is, is that how do you come 50 and 50? See, my strong belief is that in a relationship, if I'm not investing 100%, and if my partner's not investing 100%, then we're not doing our fair share. And my 100% may be a lot more investment than Shirley's 100%. But it's about how much I invest in that relationship. See, my responsibility in the relationship is to wake up every morning and make sure to, that Shirley is satisfied for the day, that Shirley is happy, that Shirley's needs are met. Because when Shirley's needs are met, the rewards Lloyd gets are far greater than the rewards I ever could demand. Okay. Because Shirley's more gentle, Shirley's more kind, Shirley's more concerned about how my day went many things about that and everything else. So relationships are really about what I'm willing to invest in that relationship. And if I'm not willing to invest in it, you know, I can't say that if I don't, well, I'm not gonna invest in it because she doesn't do anything. The other thing is Shirley and I had been married about 35 years uh, when I started doing domestic violence counter treatment program. After I did this, because the first year I did it, I thought I can go in and tell these guys how they should behave and everything's gonna be fine. And I was sucked at facilitating domestic violence offender group. But what I realized is that eventually that I was a male and the things that we talked to them about was male beliefs and that I could straighten that out <clears throat> if I took some of those male beliefs in. And what Shirley would tell you is that after I started doing domestic violence offender treatment program, that at 35 years, we thought we had a pretty good marriage. Shirley said it got even better after I realized that I was still a male, that I still had some male belief, and that I became more considerate. So I think I'm running short on time here. Um, I think that these were kind of talked about. There, there were barriers um, to escaping. You know, why don't people escape? Obviously, the hardest time for them to escape, or the time that they're at the most risk is that when they do try to escape. And then uh, we always look at lethality issues. Uh, years ago, there was a federal research project that was done that said men who have access to guns are more likely to use guns to kill their partner than men who don't have access to guns. I knew that a long time before they ever did the research on it. I mean, if a gun's available to me and I decide to shoot somebody, what am I gonna use? The gun, probably. Some other things, you know, we always do look at their criminal history. Uh, and um, uh, many of the men that come to our group don't have a long history of criminal history. And that's why if you use uh, LSIR, which they use in probation, a domestic violent offender, uh, I mean, we've lumped them in with criminal offenders because we've made it a criminal offense, and it should be. But they score very low on the tools that we use for criminal offenders because they don't have a lot of criminal history have domestic violence incidents. So, so we look at using a different tool to figure out how lethal they are, how they are in that area. So um, that's kind of summarizes most of our program. Some of I went through a little fast, but I sure am open to any questions and wanted to leave some time for that. Well, 
we're trained in the Duluth model. There are two basic models out there, and I've been trained in both. One's the Duluth model and one's the eMERGE model. We're trying to get away from saying that we use the Duluth model. We're trained in that model, but our program is more based on the a choice that I make to use power and control in my relationship. So our curriculum is more around that. But reality is, yeah, it comes out of, a lot of what we have has come out of Duluth. I've been trained both in Duluth and the eMERGE model out of Boston. And so I kind of try to combine both of those, and they're very similar. It's still about the same thing. But we just recently, um, in the state of North Dakota, our prison uh, brought Ed Latessa in from the University of Cincinnati. And Ed Latessa is big in years and years of um, assessing uh, probation programs and offender programs that we do and that and everything else. And so he has some things about programs that you should be doing for that. And, he doesn't like the Duluth model, so he told the prison out there that they can't use the Duluth model. And so the psychologist out there actually facilitated for us here in Grand Forks when she was at UND here um, in school, facilitated for us. And so she actually put a program back together, which is going to be given out to the judges at the judges' conference this month, I think. Um, but they, she wrote a program, and it's really based on the choice that we make by the use of power and control. Now, a lot of stuff that she put in there, she learned when we sent her to Duluth, and it was things that she brought in when she facilitated groups with us here and that and everything else. And so I personally am trying to kind of move away to say, no, we're not strictly Duluth model, but we are based on the use of power and control in the relationship. That kind of ties into what I was going to ask. Um, I'm just curious about how widespread programs like these are. Um, obviously, if there's models, then they're probably pretty widespread. I mean, are they growing uh, programs around, like this, in, throughout the state and nationally? Good question. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy now about what really works. Um, there's much more controversy out there about that our programs don't work. Uh, reality is our programs do work. Men that come to domestic violence offender treatment programs can learn two things. One is I can make a choice that I change my behavior um, and I become a better partner in my relationship. The other choice is, and I did, I co-facilitated sex offender treatment for about three and a half years when I was in probation. And one of the things that we did with sex offenders is that when another person was telling his story, we would watch the other sex offenders because we could tell which ones were getting turned on by the stories that were being told. Same thing happens there is that these guys listen for these stories and we can see them kind of getting turned on so they'll start asking more questions about how'd you get away with that and how'd you do that. And so the other thing that they do is some men come to our group and just learn how to become a better batter in their relationship. So they take the positive things out of there. So that's a negative for our program. But it outweighs, I mean, it outweighs the benefits that we get for the people that do change and for the help that we get in the relationship. Get it? He's a public defender, too. Yeah. Within the last couple of months, I've had two clients that have come in um, in homosexual relationships. One's a girl relationship, girl and girl. One's guy and guy. Um, both have domestic violence in them. And they've both been referred to new choices because it's required under the statute. Are your groups appropriate for them or not? It hasn't gotten that far yet. They've just started, but... We actually just had a, a male that's in a same-sex relationship come in the other day. We would, not, we would not put them in the male group because males are homophobic, uh, but we do do a program for them. The reality is, is that, especially in male, male relationships, what we really find is, is that we have two men living together that have some belief systems that they were raised as males that really do conflict with each other. And so some of the curriculum we change around a little bit. We still do talk about power and control in the relationship and look at that with the males that come in. But we usually do them and we don't have enough, but we would do individual with them. And same with the women, but the women seem to be a little bit more open about, yeah, it'd be okay for a gay woman to be in here, uh, you know, fathers or whatever. But um, we've really not had any women that have came in for evaluation yet that have been in the same-sex relationship. 
Well, we have had some men, and we just had one the other day, and, and if we find him appropriate, we would do something with him individually. Are there any more questions? Once you've had um, somebody that maybe you've accepted into the, do you have to accept people into the program? First of all, I guess would be the first question. And then the second question, because I'm assuming there's got to be people that are inappropriate. And some of the, the work that I've done over the years has been in um, with treatment of sex offenders and in the justice system. And in that, I've learned that there are only a small category of people that might be even amenable to treatment. Um, and really, a lot of the sex offenses is less about arousal and more closely situated to issues of power and control. So is, are there, within the larger group of individuals who are offending and perpetrating domestic violence, are there a group that are amenable to treatment and some that are not? Yes, there are some that are amenable to treatment. There are some that are not. Um, and also, you say, are they appropriate or not appropriate? We look to see if they're appropriate or not appropriate and the number we have found men that are not appropriate for a program uh, and a lot of times that's based on the offense that they had so um, the law in North Dakota kind of says that if you're part of a family and there's an incident um, then it's a domestic violence incident so we get guys come to us who have beat on their brother both adults but they had an incident with her brother or two sisters or it's been mother and daughter. And, and we consider that uh, and probably wouldn't take them in because we really talk about intimate relationships in ours. In that. The majority of the people that we see that are convicted of intimate relationships, the number that are not appropriate for a program is a very small number. It's probably less than one or two percent that we see over the year that are not appropriate. Again, that would be people that we've identified situational violence with, so it's only really been one incident. Both their partner has not given the advocate any additional information and says, no, it was just one time incident, it was just about this. Our interviews with him, uh, you know, it seems that they're very fair in the relationship and everything else. So that's, that's kind of where we go. But yeah, there are some people that, and that was the antisocial personality people that I kind of talk about, that they are just really not amenable to treatment. We've tried them in group, and they usually don't make it to our group. We usually end up at some point going back to court with those type of people. Hi, your program is called New, New Choices. Um, Choices. Now, I, na naively, I assume uh, most, if not all, of the participants are com committed? Is that they're not. They're not? Um, okay. We um, basically have three different type of people. We have those that went through the court system, they get convicted of a crime and then they're ordered into our program. And then we have those that come from social services because of deprivation case and social service, the social workers identified domestic violence in there and they'll send them to them. And then on occasion, we get a man who comes on his own he tells us, but no man really ever comes on his own. Nobody ever walked down 4th Street and said, oh, Lloyd has a program in there that would make me a better partner in a relationship, so I just want to go attend it. See, what happens with the guy that walks in and says, yeah, I'm here voluntarily, is that his partner has pretty much bottom-lined him and said, you're going to be on the street if you don't change this behavior. And so she's finally taken a stance against him and said, you need to do this. Now, they don't do good in our program because they spend about three or four sessions in our program and then they go back and tell her, you don't know how lucky you are to have me. You should hear what those guys did to their partner. I've never did that to you. I was going to ask how crucial it is, in a sense, for the success of the uh, participants in the program to, to be willing to change their behaviors and uh, patterns and so forth. Yeah. Well, the court order does help. The, you know, having jail time hanging over their head, all of those things help. But the real motivation for them wanting to change that behavior needs to come within. And so that's really why we talk to them about how satisfied they want to be in a relationship, you know, and what's really satisfying for them in a relationship. All right, and I think we're going to close it up now. So thank you so much, Lloyd, for coming in to tell us about the New Choices program.